tomorrow starts our first day of school for the 2023-2024 school year. And one of the questions I get most often about homeschooling is homeschooling high school. And how do I do it? Um, I have a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I could never do high school. And so I wanted to share with you what our curriculum choices are this year and actually how easy it is to homeschool high school. I think it's actually even easier than homeschooling your littles. So we are in Georgia and the homeschool requirements for Georgia are actually very vague and very relaxed. And as a homeschool mom, I have come to appreciate that. At first, it made me very stressed out because I'm a type A personality and I like to make sure that I'm checking off all the boxes and doing everything that's expected. But what I have found in having more relaxed um, constraints with homeschooling is that it gives me the freedom to do a lot more life skills and also pick through curriculum and subjects and decide what's really important versus what is not important. Um, and I see this every year during tax season, but I always love, there's a meme that goes around on Instagram and Facebook and it says, gee, I'm really glad that I learned about parallelograms in high school instead of taxes because that really helps me during parallelogram season. And I always laugh at that just because while I think a basic introduction to geometry and stuff like that is important, ultimately my goal as a parent is to have my kids become functional adults. I want them to be able to balance a checkbook, take out a mortgage, know that if they get a student loan to go to college, they're actually going to have to pay it back and the government isn't going to give them someone else's money to pay it off for them. Okay, so if you have an 18 year old and they don't understand how a loan works, schooling has failed them. And that's just our point of view on things. What else that I love about homeschooling high school is that by this point in their life, they are, or at least should be, mostly independent. So for Logan, he is going into 10th grade this year. For Logan, I basically create his lesson plans for the week and I create these a month out. This is just a Word document with a table um, and it's editable so I can change it every year as I need to. I can tweak and change the spacing or whatever, but I create his lesson plans and he follows them and that's it. Um, yes, do we sometimes have weeks where he doesn't follow them or procrastinates or whatever? Absolutely. And so, of course, as the teacher in our homeschool, I do have to go and kind of go through and check and make sure that he's doing things. But ultimately, I'm not sitting with him teaching him subjects per se. I am more of a facilitator um, than an actual one-on-one -on -one teacher. If he's struggling with something, then he'll come to me, he and I will sit down and we'll work through it. And if we can't work through it, then we will find some videos or we will go another route to solve those issues. But for the most part, by high school, he's independent. He just has to follow this checklist, okay? So every month I sit down, I go ahead and I make our lesson plans for the month. And our lesson plans, for the most part, are pretty set in stone. I don't change things too often. Both my kids and I do better when we know clear expectations and a routine and what's expected of us. So while we have learned how to kind of like fall back and punt if we need to, if an emergency happens or something unexpected comes up, for the most part, we try to follow our lesson plans um, to the letter. And that's just one area that I'm picky about because it makes me feel like I'm behind if we don't follow them. Now, I have friends who have no problems going up, oh, lessons are out for today, we're doing this instead. Um, or, you know, if I've got one kid that's sick, I'm going to do school with the other kid, I'm not going to do school with the first kid. But for the most part, we try to stick to our lesson plans pretty much as I write them. So, 
in Georgia, there are a few requirements as far as high school goes if you are looking towards a college prep diploma. Um, and that is what we're choosing to do. As of right now, Logan has decided that he wants to pursue um, a career as a DNR officer. And so for that, he is only required to have a two-year associate's degree. However, we are going to go ahead and follow through with the college prep diploma um, because then if he chooses to do a four-year college, right now we're looking at our local tech school because he can get his degree in that um, and that fulfills his job requirements. But if you want to go forward with a college prep diploma, then the easiest way to do that is to go on your state's Department of Education website and find out what are the credit requirements for your state to graduate with a college prep diploma. One of the requirements for high school is that students have to take four sciences, but they have to have at least, at least two of those sciences has to be, um, one has to be physical science and one has to be biology. And we took biology last year. We used the apology curriculum. That is who we're using for physical science. Um, I enjoy their curriculum. I find it pretty challenging. Um, biology was a little bit of a struggle for Logan. Some of that was just a content struggle. Some of that was an interest struggle. And some of that was just 15-year-old hormones, if we're being honest. But by the end, he did admit that he had learned quite a bit. Um, and so this year, we are using their physical science curriculum as well. Um, these are, this is the textbook. And then you can also order, there's a student notebook that you can order, and it's laid out very well for the students to take notes. It has the labs in it. Um, it really is worth the money just to get both things, honestly. Um, so this will be our physical science for this year. The other thing that we are doing this year is um, world history. World history and world literature are also a requirement. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing though is that World history doesn't mean that you have to do the entire world history. And if you look at a lot of curriculums, especially the ones that are done in public school, they give you just an overview of world history from pre-civilization to modern history. And while touching on those things and doing those sort of as an introduction can be beneficial, <coughs> um, we feel that we should go deeper. I want to go deeper. Um, and so this year, this is a new to us curriculum. I'm borrowing this from a friend of mine, but this year we are using the mystery of history. And this history curriculum is broken up into four different volumes. Um, it goes from prehistory or pre-civilization to like after the resurrection. Um, and then they also have a volume. The next volume, I believe, is the medieval times. Then they have the next volume is the Renaissance times. And then the volume after that would be considered all modern history. Um, I don't know that we'll work through all four of them. Uh, but doing this this year actually does fulfill our world history requirement. Um, and so that is allowing us to do a more in-depth study of a period in ancient history that does cover a portion of the world. It's not just American history. Um, we have already done American history, so he satisfied that requirement for high school already. Um, and then to go with world history uh, for his ELA requirement, world literature is also a requirement um, for high school. And so we are choosing a selection of books that would encompass a variety of both genres um, and then also specific topics. So one of our genres is going to be um, literature that crosses mediums. And so that would be a book um, or something that has been turned into a play or um, a movie. And so for that, he's going to read Julius Caesar. Um, we're also working on um, classics. So what, for what he's going to do for a British classic is going to be Animal Farm. And we're going to delve into the whole Russian Revolution and the things that happened there. Um, 
the Holocaust is another time that we are going to work on in a literature sense. And so to work on those for literature, he is going to be reading The Hiding Place. And I found a wonderful, um, like comprehensive book study, I guess, found on Teacher Paid Teacher. And I normally, when I have my kids read books, I don't ask them to do comprehension questions and a literary analysis and things like that. But this year I am for specific books. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want him to be able to practice doing a complete literary analysis with themes, character, plot, setting, all of those pieces. Um, but I'm only going to require it of one book per month. And so one book that he does on each of our monthly topics will be one that he completes a literary analysis on. And this year for our homeschool co-op, he will present those. And then I'm going to find other books in each genre for him to read, but just for us to discuss. Because I'm trying to create a little bit of a book club atmosphere. Um, if you follow Sarah McKenzie, then you know what she talks about with, you know, if you were to be in part of a book club and they were, you were to walk in and the host handed you a comprehension quiz and said, oh, here's the book we read last month. Answer these questions before we start because I want to make sure you read it. You probably wouldn't really go back to that. And for the most part, I want reading for my kids to be an enjoyable thing. I want it to be something that they pick up. Instead of kids being on their devices while we're in a waiting room, we want to be the people that bring books. Um, and so I generally don't do this often. However, because I'm using these literary analyses as part of an ELA grade, um, then for one book, he will do that. The other books that I'm going to have him read for this first month, because our topic is the Holocaust, um, we are going to read Salt to the Sea. And I've already read this book. It's a wonderful YA book. It talks about the sinking um, of, oh, let me see, the Wilhelm Gustloff, I believe is how you pronounce it. But it is a ship that was sunk during the Second World War, and it killed more people than the Titanic and the Lusitania. And I bet most people have not heard of this um, because it was a huge faux pas on the side of the German army as they were losing the war. Um, but over 5,000 children alone died on this ship. And the story itself, although this is historical fiction, um, the story itself is quite fascinating and really taught us a lot or taught me a lot um, about something I'd never heard of. So I'm having him read this one and this is one that we will just discuss. And then the other book I'm having him read for um, our Holocaust genre is Prisoner B3087. And this was recommended to me by another homeschool mom. Um, and so I'm very excited to have him read this. I will probably also read it before he gets to it. Um, but just another aspect on what it was like to be in those concentration camps and just the horrors that they survived. In order to complete his ELA requirement, sorry, it's been a long day already. In order to complete his ELA requirement, um, he does have to have some type of grammar aspect. And so the past few years, we have used the IEW writing curriculum for him, and it has been great. Um, the last two years he did following Narnia, and so with that curriculum, he was able to read all of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia series. Um, he did multiple writings. We've done research papers. We've learned how to do MLA formatting through them. <coughs> um, it has been really great. And I just will be honest with you, this year we needed a break. We had a really intense year last year, um, Algebra 1. We had biology was very intense. IEW was intense. We just had a lot going on in our year. And he came to me this year and said, Mom, I need a break from IEW. It's just too much. Um, and you can't take a break from ELA. Like, you have to have the credits. 
So we compromised and decided that we would fill his ELA requirement in a different way. And so that's what we're doing. Normally I have a curriculum for writing um, just because it is a little bit easier for me. And IEW really is one of the best ones out there in my opinion. But this year <clears throat> we'll be doing the literary analyses. And then we chose to do the Fix-It Grammar, which is um, under the IEW, the Inner Institute for Excellence in Writing, I believe. Um, but we are doing the, their fix it grammar. We've used this before when he was in middle school. Um, and then we took a break from it because the I, IEW itself kind of gives you a grammar portion. So we didn't feel that we needed to double up on it. But since we are not doing the IEW for 10th grade this year, um, we are doing fix it grammar for 10th grade. And this is really great. If you are not familiar with this, um, they give you essentially, they give you a lesson <clears throat> and they talk about different parts of grammar, different parts of speech, stuff like that. And then what you have here is you have a passage that's incorrect. You go through with what you've learned in your lesson, you fix it, and then you rewrite it. And they have, um, it's four days of it. You would do the lesson on day one and then you go through and do four days. And then the teacher book just kind of helps you facilitate with that. But um, the way that they teach things, he very much has understood, and it's also applicable grammar. It's not anything where you're having to draw the lines, and you guys remember, like, the grammar trees that we had to draw when we were in middle school and high school, and how stupid they were because I've never had anyone ask me to pull out a noun after I graduated high school. Nobody cares. They just want to know, can you write a complete sentence and sound coherent? <coughs> so this does not ask for any of that. It asks for you to apply the knowledge that they have taught you in the lesson and use it so that you can fix the thing or proofread, fix the thing that needs to be fixed. Um, so I highly recommend this, especially if you're not good at grammar, which I am not good at grammar. Um, being a teacher does not make you good at grammar. I am not good at grammar. So I like that it's easy for me to understand and help him if he makes a mistake. The other thing that we are doing this year for an elective, um, it is required that we have to have a health elective. <coughs> now, for us, that's a little bit of a joke. Um, we've already done, you know, the birds and the bees talk. We know about healthy eating. We know about physical exercise. We know about all of that. If you follow on our channel, you see we do quite a bit of that stuff just as our natural life. But we are required to do a health elective um, for high school credit. And so we chose this curriculum this year. This is one that is new to me. I ordered it from Christian book, I believe. Um, I have never used this before. I have friends of ours that used it, recommended it because it's pretty simple. It's cut and dry. You kind of read through it, you answer the questions and you're done. Um, <coughs> and so since I didn't really want the health to be this major production this year, um, I really wanted him to be able to focus on his main core academic subjects. We took a simpler route for this. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping it'll be simple. I'll have to report back and tell you guys how all of these work, but especially the new ones since we're not familiar with it. And then finally, the last two subjects that he has this year are going to be um, Algebra 2. <clears throat> so last year he took Algebra 1. And typically in our school system, they um, offer Algebra 1, then you take Geometry, then you take Algebra 2, and then you take your fourth math, like Trig or Calc or whatever. I think that's stupid. I'm not going to lie. Once you get the hang of Algebra and Algebra 1, I don't know why you would take a year off and learn about shapes and angles to then go back and have forgotten everything so that you can start over for Algebra 2. So we decided we're going to make it make sense. And this is where having um, that option to change things around in your homeschool is really awesome. But we are making it make sense. So he did Algebra 1 last year. He's doing Algebra 2 this year. And then next year, he'll do Geometry. Now we do algebra, or we do all of his math through um, an online program called Teaching Textbooks. 
I absolutely love this program. It is computer-based or you can do it off of your phone. There's an app that you can run it off of your phone. So if you don't have home internet, which we just got for the first time in 23 years of having this house, um, you can run it off the app on your phone. It's great. <coughs> Sorry. My allergies have been driving me nuts. So thank you guys for putting up with me. But we love this because it is very cyclical in the fact that there's a constant review every lesson. I can monitor his lessons. I can also set a limit. So if he makes below an 80 on a lesson, he automatically has to go back and redo that lesson. And while the content in that lesson doesn't change, he is required to go back through and listen to the whole lesson rework the problems, and then if he's still struggling, he and I can work on something separate. But I have control that he's not just going to speed through and say, oh, I made a 70 on that lesson. It's fine. I'll pick it up in the next lesson. It's a very good mix of videos and examples and then interaction where you solve problems throughout the lesson. Um, there's tests every maybe 10 to 15 lessons. It kind of varies depending on what the topic is. Um, but it has been really excellent for him. One, I haven't had to teach high school math, which I should not teach high school math. I was not a high school teacher. Um, I was an elementary school special ed teacher for 17 years. So I should not be teaching high school math. Um, but two, he does very well with things that are technological. The program that he attended in our county before COVID even hit, our county offered a blended learning program where he went to school two days a week and then the other three days he did everything online. He got very good at that. So if you have kiddos that do well with computer-based things, I would really recommend that you check this out. It's also very affordable. Um, it's about $70 for a complete school year's worth of stuff and you have essentially an entire calendar year to complete the course. Um, so that gives you plenty of time to do it. Um, there's usually over, just slightly over 100 lessons. I think the last, I think Algebra 1 had 120 lessons maybe. But because he does well with the technology side of things, this also breaks it up for him. <coughs> so he does get to use a little bit of technology in our homeschool. Um, and for us, because we didn't have internet until just a few weeks ago. Being able to do it on the phone was a lifesaver for us because it wasn't required that we had um, a desktop or a laptop or whatever. To me, it is a little easier to see the things on a laptop. Um, that could just be old eyes, um, you know, the joys of being 40. But for him, he was fine to do it on his phone. Um, so we'll see how he does it this year if he decides to go back to the computer since we have internet, um, but either way, the curriculum, teaching textbooks, highly, highly recommend it. The other curriculum that we're using that's online, or it's an app, is the Duolingo app for his Spanish elective. We have to take two years of the same foreign language for a college prep diploma. And so he chose Spanish, um, well, we sort of chose Spanish together. He wanted to take French and I felt that Spanish was gonna be a little bit more useful in life because he's not planning on going to France anytime soon <coughs> or moving to Louisiana. So with those things in mind, um, we decided that Spanish was a good um, language for him to take. We looked at a few different apps. We looked at a few different programs, Rosetta Stone, um, Babel, I think, was one of them, and decided that Duolingo offered the most comprehensive uh, curriculum for free, which I appreciate. The other thing is, because there are so many units in Duolingo, he essentially completes about 10 units a year, and that is a year's worth of curriculum. That's 120 hours of curriculum. Um, that's 120 hours of him doing things, and it gives you grades. It doesn't give you like a, a final exam or um, a summary of grades. So I would say that is the downside to Duolingo. 
after every lesson, he has to record his grade on his grade sheets that I've printed out for him. So you have to keep track of the grades. Whereas like in teaching textbooks, they keep track of them for you. And at the end of the year, you can print the grade book and print like their final grade for their transcript. Um, Duolingo does not do that. So you do have to keep up with that. But other than that, the lessons themselves are really fun. They're sort of like a game. And there are days that he will do Spanish that um, like even on the weekend sometimes because he's part of a challenge or he wants to get coins or whatever. So if you have a kid who's kind of competitive, I would definitely say check into this one as far as a foreign language option because it is, it's fun for them. Like he likes it. Um, I have seen some things online that they do push, um, I won't even say push, they do use some same-sex type couples um, for some of their examples. So if you're using it with younger kids, I would probably say you need to do it with them or this might not be the app for you. As far as us, we have had all those discussions. Um, we're very clear on what our beliefs are. And so that's not something that I'm shying away from with him because he is in high school. Um, like I said, we've talked about all the things. He knows um, how we believe. And so we just kind of scooch over those. Luckily, I would say there haven't been very many um, of those as examples, probably less than five in the entire year that he's done it. Um, two years. One year. One year he's done it. Sorry, we finished one year of it. This is our second year. Um, so, and he enjoys it so much. We honestly are um, considering just having him complete the entire course. I think there's 100, 110 units total. Um, we are honestly just looking at having him do um, Spanish every year until he graduates just because it is such um, a good tool to have, especially in the field that he wants to go into. And then living in Georgia, we have a good number of migrant families. We are seeing um, a higher Hispanic population. Um, and so it's just good to know and be aware of, you know, the languages that are around you. So I do recommend Duolingo, especially if you were looking for something free. Um, and that's an app on the phone. So let me see, did I cover all of it? I think so. This is definitely a different video than what I normally do, but homeschooling is such a big part of our life that I felt like it was time to start sharing with you guys what we were doing. Homeschooling high school, uh, I was scared of it at first, and it honestly has been very simple, um, and I, I like that I get to be home with him. When we decided that I was going to stay home which um, we decided actually before COVID hit that I was going to stay home and then COVID hit and I was kind of like, all right, God, I see what you did there. Um, I was really nervous about it because I felt like I didn't have a chance to mess up. You know, when your kids are a little bitty, if you don't teach them something one year, oh, you're in kindergarten, it's fine. We can do it next year, you know, but when your kids are getting into that high school age and you're, you're dealing with things like SATs and and colleges and looking at what they want to do later in life, you just feel like the time is ticking and it's so much more important that you don't miss anything. Um, and I think that feeling really hasn't changed for me. What has changed for me as we have gone along, this is our third year homeschooling. This will be our third year homeschooling. Um, just has been the fact that as Logan has gotten older, we used to really converse about his school and he gets to make decisions too. So there are times that he comes to me and says, mom, can I just do all of my math today? And then I'm not going to do anything else for school. Um, I just, I want to get all this math done and off my plate so that I can work on this project or whatever. And my answer for that is you have your lesson plans for the week. As long as the week's work gets done by the end of the week, I don't care. Um, I just don't want to, I just don't want it to roll over or whatever. Um, and he's getting to the point where he is mature enough to be able to self-monitor and learn those skills because I'm not babysitting him. And those are the skills that are going to make him successful in tech school or if he chooses to go to a four-year university. Um, being able to, you know, kind of 
<clears throat> break it down, prioritize topics, prioritize subjects, prioritize projects, what needs to be done. These are lessons that he's learning now that he's not going to necessarily learn in a high school because you have <coughs> different expectations and you go to a class every day and you have someone kind of lecturing and you sitting there and listening. So he's learning these independent skills in my dining room, which is really cool. Um, it's also been neat because a lot of the times what we talk about when he asks a question about a subject or about a book he's reading, we get to have sort of in-depth conversations because I've usually read the book that he's reading um, and I'm going, oh, have you gotten to this part yet? And we get to have this really interesting conversation and I get so much more out of him than if I asked him to write a paper on every single book he read or take a comprehension quiz or whatever. Like we get to sit down and we get to talk about ideas, not just regurgitate the book. Yes, you read it. Great. We're done. Um, you know, we get to have those deeper conversations about morals and values and what do you think this character was trying to learn or how could they have done it differently or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so highly recommend looking into high school homeschooling if you're nervous. Be nervous. It's okay. Be nervous. I won't even say don't be nervous because that's stupid. Be nervous, <clears throat> but know that you can do it and you don't have to have a teaching degree to do it. And even if you do have a teaching degree, it's not going to help you at all with homeschooling. Like not at all. Nothing. Nothing I learned in any of my teaching degree, including all the way up through my master's, nothing has helped me with homeschooling. What has helped me is the fact that I love my kids and I want to see them do well and I'm going to plan out what is going to get them to their goal as quick as possible. And so that has been really cool because I get to have a say so and you need to learn this so that you can do this. And so for us, the end goal is not graduation. The end goal is what job do you want? What dream do you have? What do you want to become? And that's been really fun to help them realize that some things we have to do because the state says so, but the rest of it, we get to create because it's based on what their dream is, not just what they're supposed to do. I will put a list of all of the things that we are using down in the description of the video. So if you have any questions, feel free to comment um, or you can jump over to my Instagram. It's the same name, not the cool mom. And you can shoot me a message there. Um, I'm happy to share anything that I have with you. I can even email you the template that I use for the kids. Um, I will probably be making a video for um, Kevin. He goes into second grade this year. So I'll probably do a homeschool video for him as well, just so you can see what we're doing on the younger end of things. Um, but thanks for coming today and watching this. And I hope to see you guys soon.